Through the past few weeks, we have been studying together the Gospel 1844 and the Judgment. It's been an important lesson, and most of what we've been studying has come from the book of Daniel. And that's where we're going to continue our study this morning. Our study is in Daniel chapter 8. And by God's grace, we'll be able to make it through the whole chapter. We will see how, we, how quickly we can move through this. There's a lot of important information that you will see as we work our way through. But before we get into Daniel chapter 8, let's just review briefly two very important passages, two visions that we find in the book of Daniel that set the stage for Daniel chapter 8. The first is Daniel chapter 2. You're familiar with that. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. And in his dream, he saw an image comprised of different metals. The head of the image was made out of what? Made out of gold. It represented the Babylonian Empire. Next, there were the chest and arms of silver, which represented which kingdom? Medo-Persia. Then the belly and the thighs of brass, which represented the kingdom of? Greece. Then the legs of iron which represented the iron monarchy of Rome. And then the feet were a mixture, part of iron, part of clay, representing the territory of Rome that was divided up and the, Western, the countries of Western Europe today. And then as Nebuchadnezzar in this dream, he looks and he sees a stone that is cut out without hands. And the stone comes and strikes the image on the feet, grinds up all the different metals, and the stone grows and fills the whole earth. Now what does that stone represent? It represents Jesus. Jesus said in the gospel, the one who falls upon this stone, speaking of himself, will be broken. But woe unto the one upon whom this stone falls, for it will grind him to powder. A definite reference there to Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 2 sets the stage for all the following visions and prophecies that we find throughout the book of Daniel. Now something interesting as we study through Daniel, we find the same thing happening in the book of Revelation. A vision will be given in one passage and then it will be expanded on in another vision and further details will be given. And then it will be even expanded on a little bit further on. And we find this happening in Daniel. Daniel 2 sets the stage and then last week we studied Daniel 7. And if you remember, in Daniel 7, Daniel in vision sees a sea and wind blowing upon the sea. According to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, water or sea represents multitudes and nations and tongues. And so here is the wind representing strife and commotion, striving on the sea representing nations and kingdoms. And as a result of this, four different beasts rise up out of the sea. Now in Bible prophecy... A beast represents what? Represents a nation or a kingdom. So as a result of the strife, four kingdoms will arise. And the first beast that Daniel sees in vision is like a lion. But something interesting about this lion, it has eagle's wings. And of course that represents the kingdom of Babylon. Next he sees a bear coming up out of the sea. But the interesting thing about this bear is it's raised up on the one side. And it has three ribs in its mouth. You remember that? Now, what is the significance of the bear, and why is it raised up on the one side? Well, the bear represents Medo-Persia, doesn't it? And the raising up on the one side represents the domination of the Persians over the Medes. Some have suggested that the three ribs in the bear's mouth could represent the three principal nations that the Medo-Persian Empire conquered, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. And then after the bear in Daniel 7, he looks and the next beast that comes up is a leopard. But this is a strange leopard. It's got how many heads? Four, Four heads and how many wings? Four wings. Now what kingdom followed Medo-Persia? The kingdom of Greece. And of course the four heads on the leopard represent the four divisions of the Greek empire. The wings represent the speed at which Greece rose to power under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And the next beast that Daniel sees in chapter 7 that comes up from the sea is sort of a nondescript beast. It's a strange beast. Some have even pictured it as some kind of a, a dinosaur. It has great iron teeth and these ten horns on its head. 
And the ten horns is what draws the attention of Daniel because as he looks at the ten horns on this fourth beast, he notices a little horn that comes up and the little horn uproots three of the other horns. Are you familiar with that? Now, of course, this fourth beast represents what? Rome, represents Rome, just like the legs in Daniel chapter 2 represented the iron monarchy of Rome. The ten horns represent the division into which Roman territory was divided. Sometimes we refer to it as the, the ten tribes that came down from the north or the barbarian tribes or Germanic tribes that came down and divided up the territory of Rome. The little horn, of course, represents the rise of the medieval church, the papal church. And the three horns that were uprooted represent the, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Heruli. And then the focus is drawn in Daniel 7 to a judgment scene. Now this is interesting. This is not mentioned in Daniel 2. The vision sort of focuses on divided Rome, and the next thing is the second coming of Jesus. But Daniel 7 adds some more details, and the focus here is on the judgment scene. In vision, Daniel sees one like unto the Son of Man, which is Jesus, come to the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father. The judgment is set, and the books are open. And we have a little bit of a description of this judgment scene. Well, that brings us to Daniel 8. Now, Daniel 8 covers basically the same kingdoms, except for Babylon, but it covers the next few kingdoms. But the focus then is drawn, after talking about the little horn, the focus then is drawn to the judgment scene, just as it was in Daniel 7. But the difference between Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 is that the judgment scene in Daniel 8 actually gives us a time prophecy. Now, out of the book of Daniel, for Advent, it's probably one of the verses that... Uh, almost every Adventist knows by heart, is Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. We find the longest time prophecy in Scripture. We call it the 2,300-day prophecy. And so the difference between chapter 8 and chapter 7 is in 8, we actually have a time prophecy that's connected and associated with the judgment that was described in chapter 7. So that's what we want to look at this morning. We want to review through Daniel chapter 8, but we want to give particular attention to this time prophecy, the 2300 days, and how that relates to the judgment, and what does the Bible mean when it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 is actually our memory text. It says, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So that's what we want to try and understand this morning. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Daniel 8. We'll start in verse 1. And we'll work our way through, and I will need some help looking up some texts as we go through this as well. Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Now, in the first year of the reign of Belshazzar, that's when Daniel had the first vision recorded in chapter 7. And now a year has gone by, and Daniel has a second vision, and this is the third year of the rule of Belshazzar. Something else interesting for those of you who are scholars and like to study the Bible in depth, Daniel is written in two languages. Did you know that? It's not just Hebrew, but it's Aramaic and Hebrew. What's interesting is from chapter 8 onwards to the end of the book, the language that the original was written in is Hebrew. Before that, it was mostly Aramaic. Now, that's kind of significant because when we work our way through this, we're going to be looking at a term that we find in the Hebrew that helps to explain the origin of the little horn power. But let's not go there right now. We'll get to that a little bit later on. From 8 onwards, it's written in Hebrew. Who is Belshazzar? Now, to be honest with you, uh, some skeptics and some scholars of Scripture doubted the accuracy of the book of Daniel because on the archaeological finds from the ancient site of Babylon, they discovered clay tablets that spoke of the king at the time with the fall of Babylon being Nabonidus, not Belshazzar. And so some skeptics even looked at Babylon and said, this guy Belshazzar, there's no historical record of him. Uh, how can he really be the king? And of course, Daniel makes it clear that Belshazzar was king when Babylon fell. However, in 1924, a man by the name of Sidney Smith translated some clay tablets that were discovered at the ancient site of Babylon. On the clay tablets, it was written that Nabonidus entrusted the kingship 
to his son Belshazzar. You see, what happened was Nabonidus, who was the king, he went out on an extended war campaign and he left Babylon under the control of his son Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was actually in Babylon on the throne when Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians. Uh, this was a wonderful find. It validated the scriptures. And that happens more and more. The more archaeological archeologi finds are made, the more they validate the truths of Scripture. And since then, other clay tablets have been found, once more validating that Belshazzar was indeed the king when Babylon fell to the Mede and Persians. This confirms the accuracy of the Scriptures. Uh, one other thing about that, if you remember uh, in Daniel chapter 5, it actually talks about the fall of uh, Babylon. And there was the hand that appeared and wrote on the wall. Remember that? Menemanetekelu Farsin. And Belshazzar was afraid and he said, Whoever can come and read the writing on the wall, I will make him third ruler in the empire. Now it's kind of significant that Belshazzar said third ruler. Why not second? Well, because he was the second ruler. His father was the first ruler. Nabonidus. So he was the second ruler. Thus he said, whoever can read the writing would be the third ruler in the kingdom. And you know, without understanding this background with Nabonidus giving the kingdom over to his son Belshazzar, we can't understand that verse where he says you'll be the third ruler. But now it makes sense. And archaeological finds prove that to be so. All right, verse 2. It says, I saw in vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan or Susa depending upon which translation you use in the palace which is in the province of Elam and I saw in a vision and I was by the river Eula while Shushan at the time of the vision was part of the Elam province however the province of Elam still belonged to Babylon at this time but it was first conquered by Cyrus before the actual fall of Babylon itself it talks about Daniel being at the palace this area of Susa or Shushan was where the Persian kings would have their winter residence. So they would spend most of the year in Babylon, but for winter they would go to the area of Susa. So it must have been a very beautiful place. The river here, uh, Ula, is an unidentified river. We're not quite sure what river this is. Verse 3, Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had how many horns? Two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now, one thing that's different from Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 is that in Daniel chapter 8, the vision does not start with the kingdom of Babylon, as it does in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And the reason for that is this is the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. The kingdom of Babylon is coming to an end. And so the focus in chapter 8 is on the next kingdom that would arise after Babylon. So here we see, first of all, this ram that has these two horns, and the one is higher than the other. Well, what is the ram with the two horns? What does it symbolize? We don't have to guess. The Bible is its own interpreter. Would someone look up verse 20 for us? Daniel 8, verse 20. And if we have the mic, if someone would read that for us. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. Who does the ram represent? And the two horns. Thank you. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Thank you. So no guesswork involved in that. The ram represents Media Persia. Why is it that the one horn is higher than the other? Well, the Persians, even though they came up after the kingdom of Media, they were the ones that grow, grew to prominence. It was around 550 BC that Cyrus defeated uh, the kingdom of Media. But the interesting thing is that even though the Persians defeated uh, the Medes, the Medes were not looked at by the Persians as a conquered foe, but rather as, an, um, as a nation to work with, as an assistant perhaps, or, or maybe as an ally. And so they sort of worked together when they came up against Babylon. But the Persians did rise to dominance, and they were much stronger eventually than the Medes. Verse 4 continues. And it says, And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and he became great. So yeah, it's talking about this ram pushing to the west, to the north, to the south. It's doing according to its will. It becomes great. This is a description of the conquests of Medo-Persia. 
Cyrus conquered the west. He conquered Lydia, Babylon. And then Cam Cambyses conquered to the south. He conquered Egypt in about 525 BC. Darius conquered to the north. And so Medo-Persia became a powerful empire that actually controlled more territory than Babylon itself. In the days of Esther, the kingdom of Persia extended all the way from India right down to Egypt. So it became a very powerful nation. It says here in verse 4 that this power would do according to its will, it would become great. An interesting thing about this is that the title of the Persian kings was king of kings and king of nations. So up until that point, the world had never seen a nation that became so strong and so powerful and that ruled over such a large territory. Verse 5, And as I was considering, considering behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the he-goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now once more, the Bible does not allow us to guess the identity of these symbols. It actually tells us what these symbols are. Verse 21, Daniel 8 verse 21. Would someone read that for us? Maybe on the side, right in the front. Do we have the mic here? Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. Here comes the mic. Uh, verse 21 is what I'm looking for. Daniel chapter 8 and the verse 21. Goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Thank you. So there again, this goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And this big horn represents Alexander the Great. It says that this power would come from the west. Greece arose in the west. It says this goat did not touch, or rather this, um, this goat, yes, did not touch the ground. This is a description of the astonishing speed at which Alexander the Great conquered. It talks about this notable horn, which of course represents Alexander the Great. Now there's some more interesting facts about Alexander the Great that we find in chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, that expand on this. Remember, each of the visions, they expand, gives a, a few more details. So would someone on this side read chapter 11, verse 3 and 4? Do we have the mic? Chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion, and and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. So this, this horn, this notable horn, represents Alexander the Great. I've heard some amazing stories about the bravery of Alexander the Great. On one occasion, he was going up to take a city, and it was a very dangerous approach to the city. And they had to climb up this ladder to get over the wall, and uh, Alexander's men were somewhat afraid to go. And Alexander himself led his army and was the first one to climb the ladder to get over the wall to take on the enemy. Just a very brave person and uh, bloodthirsty. Uh, he conquered and conquered and conquered. Um, and finally, at the age of 32, he had conquered the whole then known world and he was back in Babylon and he actually wept because there was no more to conquer. 32 years old. He had reached the height of his power. The kingdom of Greece grew very rapidly under Alexander the Great. Verse 6 says, And he came to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and he ran unto him in the fury of his power. This, of course, represents Greece making war with Medo-Persia. When it talks about the fury of his power, it's talking about the sudden and complete overthrow of the Medo-Persian Empire by Greece. Verse 7, And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was moved with choler, that's the old English word for anger, against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So complete overthrow of Medo-Persia by Greece. This verse depicts the completeness of the overthrow of um, Persia by Alexander. The country was ravished. The army was destroyed. The cities were plundered. Even the royal city of the Persians was destroyed by fire. So complete overthrow. Verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken 
and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So at the height of Alexander's power, uh, his kingdom was taken from him, he died. Uh, the phrase there, waxed very great, in the Hebrew means literally magnified himself exceedingly. And that's exactly what Alexander the Great did, magnified himself exceedingly. But he fell at the height of his power, 32 years of age. He was in Babylon, several days of drunken revelry and feasting. Uh, Alexander the Great came down with a fever. And the principal leaders in his kingdom came to him and said, Who's going to be your successor? And he said, The one who is the strongest will rule my kingdom. Well, evidently, his four generals heard that, and each of them thought that they were to be the stronger. <laughs> And so as a result, after the death of Alexander the Great, there was conflict between the four generals and eventually the territory of Greece was divided up amongst these four generals. The four generals, Ptolemy, he ended up getting Egypt, Palestine and part of Syria. Cassander ended up getting Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus got Thrace and a large part of Asia Minor. And then Seleucus, he got the bulk of what had been the Persian Empire. He got the rest of Asia Minor. He got northern Syria, Mesopotamia, and the east. Looking at verse 9, and it says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. Now this is where it helps to understand the language that the text was originally written in. When some Bible scholars at first studied this verse, they were a little confused as the historians studied this, because according to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, the kingdom that was to follow Greece would be what? Rome. Rome was to follow. And when they read this verse, it sounded as though this little horn, which represents Rome, would arise from one of the four divisions of the Greek Empire. And so they looked at that and they scratched their head and they said, well, Rome didn't really rise from one of the four divisions of the Greek Empire, but rather it came from the West. It wasn't really a part of the Greek Empire. But if you take a closer look at this verse, and you look at the phrase in particular where it says, and out of one of them, and you look at the word them, in the original Hebrew language you find something interesting. In the original Hebrew, the word for them is in the masculine form. Is in the masculine form. That's kind of significant. I'll tell you why. Winds can be either masculine or feminine, but horns are only in the feminine form. In other words, if it says this little horn power would arise from one of the four horns, if that what was intended, the them would have to be in the feminine because the horns are in the feminine tense. But if what is being referred to here in the original language is not the four horns, meaning the four divisions of the Greek Empire, but rather one of the four winds, and the four winds represent the four points of the compass. In other words, what is being said here, that this little horn power would not arise from one of the four horns, but from one of the four points of the compass. Well, that makes sense. If you look at it from that way, suddenly it makes sense. Rome did arise from one of the four points of the compass, but it did not arise from one of the four divisions of Greece. Does that make sense? And in the original language, it narrows it down so that the only understanding is that the little horn would not come from one of the horns, the four horns, but rather it would arise from one of the four points of the compass. And that's alluded to also in chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, when we spoke about his kingdom being divided amongst the four horns. All right, so the little horn then, after that long explanation of the masculine and feminine, uh, the little horn then represents the kingdom of... Rome. And it did arise uh, out of one of the points of the compass. Um, it was also interesting that Rome came from the west and conquered to the uh, east, conquered to the south, conquered to the north, because it came over from the west. Now this little horn represents Rome in both its pagan as well as papal phases. On the one hand, it represents pagan Rome. Pagan Rome warred, warred against the Jews and the early Christians. And in a second sense, it represents papal Rome, which continues right down to our day today. Uh, it says that this horn would arise towards the south. Rome conquered Egypt in about 168 BC. It would go towards the east. It conquered the Seleucid Empire in 65 BC. And it would go towards the pleasant land. Now, in the mind of Daniel, 
what was the pleasant land? The pleasant land was Israel, Jerusalem, Palestine. And Palestine was eventually incorporated in the Roman Empire in 63 BC. And of course, Rome was the power that was ruling the world when Jesus was born. Verse 10 says, And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. So this little horn power would grow exceedingly, and would even make war against the host of heaven. What is the host of heaven? Again, we can't guess. The Bible tells us. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 8. Would someone read that for us on this side? Right here in the front. It's chapter 8, verse 24. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. So this little horn power would actually persecute. It would be a persecuting power, and it would make war against God's true followers. Now there's two ways to understand this. On the one hand, it could represent the work that pagan Rome did in persecuting the Christians. Under Diocletian and Nero, there was tremendous persecution. But in a broader sense, it could also represent the persecutions that took place during the, the Middle Ages, during the uh, time when church and state combined. And those who refused to bow the knee to the papal throne, they were viciously persecuted. For example, the Waldensians and some of the early reformers suffered persecution. That's what it's referring to when it talks about the host of heaven. And then it goes on and it says, the last part of verse 8, stamp the residue. This refers to the persecution of God's people, both pagan and papal Rome. Verse 11, and he, that's this little horn, would magnify himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Well, let's identify a few of the symbols. First of all, he will magnify himself even to the prince of the host. Well, if the host represents God's people, according to verse 24, who then is the prince of the host? Must refer to Jesus. So this little horn power would magnify itself even to Jesus. Now the little horn represents both pagan and papal Rome. In what sense did pagan Rome magnify itself even to the prince of the host? Well, it was Pontius Pilate, a Roman general who actually sentenced Jesus to death and had him crucified. But in a broader sense, it was also through the papal system that the Bishop of Rome eventually received um, from the state and then from the church some of the same titles and even authority of Christ himself. He became Christ's representative on earth. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Very interesting. And then it goes on and it says, By him the daily sacrifice was taken away. Another word for daily sacrifice could also be continual sacrifice was taken away. Now in a first sense, referring to pagan Rome, it can refer to the destruction of the temple which took place in 70 AD. And Jesus referred to this when in Matthew 24, verse 15 through 20, he spoke about the abomination of desolation. Now let's look that up because it's kind of interesting. Matthew 24, verse 15. Uh, if someone on this side would read that for us, Matthew chapter 24, and um, read for us verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the, the prophet, standing in the host place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, so here Jesus is referring to a time when the Christians would have to flee to the mountains who were staying in Jerusalem, in the area of Judea. Well, that happened in 70 A.D., when under Titus, the Roman armies came, surrounded Jerusalem, and eventually destroyed the temple and destroyed the city. So there Jesus is identifying the abomination of desolation as being pagan Rome. But not only does it refer to pagan Rome, it also refers to papal Rome. You see, we find in Hebrews, and if someone had looked this up, there's some very important text here that we want to consider. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21. If someone had looked that up, referring to the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 7 verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. All right. So here the verse tells us that there is hope for every single person because Jesus is our high priest. Amen. Ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. He is our advocate with the Father. 
He is pleading our case. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the continual ministry that Jesus is doing on our behalf. He's our advocate in the heavenly sanctuary, ministering for His people. What we find uh, pagan as well as papal Rome doing is trying to obscure or take away this special high priestly ministry that Jesus is doing on our behalf. It was through the different types and ceremonies and traditions that were set up by the medieval church that the high priestly ministry of Jesus was eclipsed from the minds of people. For example, it was taught that the only way that you could have salvation was if you were a member of the established church and if you participated in their communion service. That was the only way you could have salvation. You had to come to a priest in order to have your sins forgiven. You had to make confession to a priest. Friends, I am so glad that we are not saved by a church or by some creed, but we are saved by a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And He is our High Priest, and we can go to Him and confess our sins and receive the forgiveness and the cleansing because He ever lives to make intercession for us. So that's this continual sacrifice, this daily sacrifice that was being referred to. It also says the place of His sanctuary shall be cast down. When it refers to pagan Rome, it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. But when it refers to papal Rome, it's talking about the obscuring of Christ's high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and establishing an earthly system of priests through which people needed to go in order to try and receive forgiveness, to receive salvation. Verse 12, Daniel 8, verse 12. It says, And a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So this is referring to the papal period when it received its power from the emperor of Rome. It ruled over nations and kings. And still today, the papal power is very influential even in, in politics, world politics. The presidents and prime ministers of nations would go consult and visit in the Vatican. It says it would cast down the truth. Uh, during the Dark Ages, many false doctrines and teachings crept into the Christian church that obscured the good news of salvation by grace through faith. And that's what the Re Reformation was all about, was reaffirming and proclaiming the good news that we are saved because of what Jesus has done for us. And we can accept that by grace. We don't have to try and earn the favor of God. We can come to Him and receive the mercy and the grace that He has in store for us. Of course, the papal power ruled for a very long time. You have the 1260-year period from 538 A.D. to 1798. And we'll probably talk about that in a later study. Looking at verse 13. And I heard one saint speaking to another, and to that certain saint, and it said, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So as Daniel is in vision and he sees first of all the rise of Medo-Persia and then he sees the rise of Greece and then his focus is drawn on this little horn power that would grow and become exceedingly great and would eventually persecute God's people. Then suddenly the question is asked, how long will this power continue? to persecute God's people, how long will the truth of Christ's high priestly ministry on our behalf be trodden down? How long until Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary will be brought to light and will be shared with the masses? That's the question that is being asked. How long are these things going to continue? Then the answer comes back in Daniel 8 verse 14, that very familiar verse. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then what will happen? The sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, according to Bible prophecy, when calculating prophetic periods of time, there is an important principle that we need to bear in mind. We call it the day for a year principle. Are you familiar with that? In Bible prophecy, one literal day equals, or one prophetic day equals one literal year. So when we're talking about 2,300 days, uh, prophetic days, it actually represents 2,300 literal days. Years, very significant period of time. Now, the verses that we often use to establish this principle of one prophetic day for one literal year is Numbers 14:34 and also Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6, where it says, "I have appointed thee each day for a year." 
So here we have the 2,300 year prophecy. It's one of the longest that you find in scripture. When does the 2,300 year prophecy begin? And when will it end? And what does it mean when the verse speaks of the cleansing of the sanctuary? What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? What does that mean for us today? Well, first of all, the 2,300 day prophecy is expanded on in Daniel chapter 9, where we actually have the starting point given, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, that went out in 457 B.C. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. We'll do that later. So if you start with 457 B.C. as the starting period for the 2300 day prophecy and you go through time, you will end up in 1844 at the end of the 2300 year period. Now remember, when you transition from B.C. to A.D., there is no year zero. You remember that. If you include, it just goes from 1 B.C., to 180. There's no zero. And so you want to bear that in mind when you do your calculation. But starting in 457 BC, you go forward in time, 2,300 years, you end up in the date 1844. Well, what's significant about 1844? What does it mean when it says, the sanctuary shall be cleansed? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Is this verse referring to an earthly sanctuary? No. no. What happened to the earthly sanctuary in 70 AD? It was destroyed. And you remember the last time Jesus left Jerusalem, he left the sanctuary or the temple and he said, your house is left to you desolate. In other words, the earthly sanctuary had no longer any significance when it came to man's salvation. It was a shadow and a type pointing to Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary service. And when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the veil that separated the holy and the most holy place? It was torn from top to bottom. An angel tore that, representing that the earthly system had now come to an end. And now we are focusing on the heavenly ministry of Christ. So there's a sanctuary in heaven. The next question I want to ask you is this. Does the heavenly sanctuary need to be cleansed? Now in order to understand the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, we want to go back to the earthly sanctuary and try and understand some of the symbols and the shadows that God gave in the earthly sanctuary, and then we can maybe understand better what Jesus does as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, throughout the Jewish year, if an Israelite sinned, he would take the sacrificial animal and he would bring it to the door or the gate of the sanctuary. He would lay his hands on the head of the animal. So let's just say it's a lamb. He would lay his hands on the lamb's head, and this would represent the transfer of sins from himself to the sacrificial animal. The animal would then be slain. Often the blood, some of the blood, would be caught in a small dish. And the high priest would then enter into the first compartment of the sanctuary. We call that the holy place. In the first compartment. And he would dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it on the horns of the altar of incense and on the veil. Thus, symbolically, the sin was transferred from the Israelite to the sacrifice. And then carried in the blood into the sanctuary... And symbolically, the sins were stored up, you might say, in the holy compartment of the sanctuary. Does that make sense? They're on the blood, on the horn. But then on one day, the day of Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, something significant happened. The priest, who repre the high priest who represented the nation of Israel, he would bring out two goats. Lots were cast on these two goats. The one goat would be called the Lord's goat. The other would be called Azazel, or the scapegoat. The high priest would lay his hands on the head of the Lord's goat, again representing the transfer of sins, and the priest represented the nation of Israel, the transfer of sins from the people to the goat. The goat was then sacrificed. Some of the blood of the goat was taken by the high priest, and he entered into the first compartment, but it didn't stop at the veil, as he would throughout the year. But on the special day, the Day of Atonement, he would actually enter into the most holy place and he would sprinkle blood right on the mercy seat. Right there in the very Shekinah glory, the presence of God. The high priest would then come out of the sanctuary and he would lay his hands on the head of a zazel or the scapegoat. And then that goat would be taken out into the wilderness where it would die. So what happened was this. Symbolically, the sins that had been stored up in the sanctuary on the day of Yom Kippur or the day of atonement were cleansed from the sanctuary. They were removed from the sanctuary and of course Azazel represents the devil and he's the one who's ultimately responsible for all the sins that has been caused and they would be laid upon Azazel. 
Now the cleansing of this earthly sanctuary was a shadow or a type of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Now there's something else important that we need to understand. The cleansing of the earthly sanctuary in the days of Israel was not merely a cleansing of a building. But in the cleansing of the sanctuary, it was a type of a cleansing of God's people. You see, on the Day of Atonement, the Israelites were to search their hearts. It was a solemn day where they gathered together, where they searched their hearts, where they made sure that all of their sins were confessed and forsaken. Only confessed and forsaken sins were cleansed. So the cleansing of the sanctuary was actually a cleansing of God's people. So likewise today, Jesus, our high priest, is ministering on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. And we're in the special time of atonement, this Yom Kippur. Jesus, our high priest, is cleansing not just a building up there in heaven, but he's actually cleansing his people here on earth. He's cleansing the sins from the hearts and the minds of his people. And just like in ancient Israel, this was to be a time of solemn searching and confessing of faults, so likewise now we are living in a very special time. Sometimes we, we refer to it as the judgment or the pre-advent judgment. It is this cleansing of sin from the hearts and the minds of people. You see, I don't believe that God will have an angel make an inaccurate entry in one of the books of heaven and state that so-and-so is cleansed from sin when in reality so-and-so is not cleansed of sin. Does that make sense? So the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is a reflection of a cleansing that's taking place here on earth. How many sanctuaries are there mentioned in the Bible? You know, one day I counted it up. I came up with five sanctuaries that we find in Scripture. The first is the heavenly sanctuary. And remember, the earthly is made after the heavenly. It's the pattern of the heavenly. So the first is the heavenly sanctuary. The second would be the earthly sanctuary. And when I say the earthly sanctuary, I'm referring to all of the earthly sanctuaries. The one in the wilderness, the one that Solomon built, the one that was built after the Babylonian captivity. You have the earthly sanctuary. Then the third sanctuary represents us as individuals. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have the body sanctuary or temple. Then the next one, the fourth one, can represent the church as a whole. We're all living stones within the temple of God. We all make up the temple or the sanctuary of God. And the fifth sanctuary that I found in the scripture is Jesus himself. Remember Jesus said, destroy this building or this temple and what? I will build it up in three days. And they said, how can you build this temple in three days? But he was speaking of himself. The next thing we need to note is this. What is the purpose of the sanctuary? God said to Moses, Build me a sanctuary that I might what? Dwell with my people or dwell amongst my people. The purpose of the sanctuary is for God to dwell with us. But why does God need a sanctuary to dwell with us? Because of sin. And the sanctuary takes care of the sin problem. Does that make sense? So God could dwell amongst Israel because of the sanctuary and through the, sac the sacrificial system and through the sanctuary system, the sin problem was taken care of so that God could actually dwell with his people. And so likewise, when Jesus came and he spoke of himself being uh, the temple, Jesus is God tabernacling or dwelling with us. And through the ministry of Jesus Christ, the sin problem was taken care of. Does that make sense? So the purpose of the sanctuary is for God to dwell with us, but in order for God to dwell with us, the sin problem needs to be cured or taken care of. That's why we find in Scripture there is a heavenly sanctuary, but when you get to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, suddenly John writes that there was no temple in the New Jerusalem. Suddenly the temple seems to vanish. Why? Because the work of the temple has finished. Does that make sense? Amen. The sin problem has been taken care of. Now God can dwell with His people unhindered. We can see Him face to face. So the purpose of the sanctuary is so that God can dwell with His people. And in order for God to dwell with His people, sin must be taken care of. So likewise, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary that we are now living in, this antitypical day of atonement, Jesus is soon to come. God is going to dwell in person with His people. But before that can happen, the sin problem needs to be taken care of. Does that make sense? Yes. 
See, God is a consuming fire to all that is sin and sinful and evil. So the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is also the cleansing of the church, the cleansing of the hearts and the minds of those who are fully surrendered to Jesus. It's a very special time that we are now living in. We know that this time will not continue forever. For the Bible tells us that time will come where Jesus will stand up and say, He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Probation will close for the human race. And after probation closes, the seven last plagues will fall. And shortly after that, Jesus will come again. That great stone that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his vision, that was cut out without hands and came and struck the image on the feet and ground up all the metals to powder and grew and filled the whole world, the coming of Jesus Christ, soon Jesus will come. But before Jesus comes, he's going to cleanse the hearts and the lives of his people from sin. Friends, that's good news. Amen? Uh, we don't have to always be chained with sin. We don't always have to be stumbling and falling over the same thing time and time again. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. That's good news. Amen. We can say, Lord, I don't deserve your grace. I'm full of mistakes and I've fallen short so many times. But I come to you, my high priest. I just say, Lord, please forgive cleanse, wash me, make me whole. And the good news is, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Friends, there is hope for every one of us. The Bible says God is able to save to the uttermost. Oh, I've read that verse many times and said, Lord, if there's anyone on the uttermost list, it's me. But please save me. It can save to the uttermost. It doesn't matter what we've gone through. Jesus is a mighty Savior. And if we come to Him in sincerity of heart, He will wash us and cleanse us and make us whole. Amen. This special cleansing is also referred to as a time of judgment. We have in Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' message. The first is, Fear God, give glory to Him for the hour of His. Judgment has come. It's a special work that takes place. And you know, friends, if uh, you get a summons to appear in court, uh, you will make sure that when that day comes and that time arrives, you are there in the court and you are wearing your finest. You want to make sure that you look your best. Does that make sense? Because you're appearing before the judge. And so likewise now, we are appearing before the judge, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we want to make sure that our hearts and our lives are fully surrendered to Jesus so that when our name comes up in the judgment, and the devil, our adversary, is there to accuse us. And the truth is, everything the devil accuses us of is probably right. But when the devil accuses us and says, you can't save him, or you can save her, look at what they've done. It's then that our advocate Jesus will step forward and say, Father, I shed my blood for that person. I've engraven their, hand, their names upon the palms of my hands. They've confessed their sins. They are mine. Jesus steps forward and takes our place. And we are saved. Friends, we want to be in that kind of a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Amen? And if ever there was a need for that, it is now. Living in the final moments of earth's history. And thank you for joining us here at uh, Sabbath School at Central Church.